The Bible says, listen to, I want you to, to finish this for me. And it's not a trick question. See if you paid attention over the years. He that spareth the rod, what? Hateth the child. What does the world say? He that spareth the rod spoils the child. The Bible says, go ahead and use the rod. That doesn't mean to take a, a, a little rod and beat your child into unconsciousness. But it's talking about proper respect, due diligence. It's talking about learning how to punish that child correctly and to discipline that child. I totally realize. And it's why the Bible comes at things in, in, in many different approaches. But I totally realize that discipline is only discipline when it works. If it doesn't work, it's wasted effort. Amen? So you discipline that child. And when we look at this, we're all children of God. That's what the Bible's about. Are you going to listen to discipline? You know, this is going to happen. The Bible tells us that God disciplines those whom he what? What's the word? I can't hear you. Loves, okay. I must be getting hard of hearing or something. Here we go. Look closely at the following verses. Word of God says this, Proverbs 6, 12 through 15. A worthless person, a wicked man, goes about with crooked speech. In other words, you don't know where it's going. He doesn't talk as though his yes is a yes and his no is a no. You just don't have any way of, uh, of understanding what's going on. Winks with his eyes, signals with his feet, points with his finger. With perverted heart devises evil, continually sowing discord. Remember in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19? The Bible says there are, are six things the Lord hates, yea, seven. And the last one he says is he who sows what? Discord among the brethren. This is talking about a worthless person, a person whenever God would say that's enough, but he continually sows discord. Therefore calamity will come upon him suddenly. In a moment he will be, be broken beyond healing. Again, as we look at this, it is not reiterating or saying that the cross is powerless. It's talking about the stubbornness of man who wants to do things in their own way. So we're, we're getting to a, a point here. We need to know and totally understand that God will have the final word on where we spend eternity. A lot of people are going to be surprised. Are they not? Atheists are going to be totally surprised. Are they not? As soon as that soul leaves their body, it's going to be one of those uh-oh moments. One of those. I remember telling you years and years ago about my dad telling me I couldn't go play basketball. I was about sixth grade, fifth or sixth grade, at the YMC, I think sixth grade. He said, son, you can't go. I want you to stay home. And I kept mouthing off to my dad, and my dad correctly sent me to my room. He says, go to your room. Don't come out until I call for you. I went to his room and thought I'd be a big boy. So I opened up the window, I crawled out, and I snuck off and went and played basketball. Well, you all know the ending of this story, I'll guarantee you. And so I snuck back after basketball. I mean, I was only gone about three hours. How would he know? So I went back, and my, my bedroom was dark just like I had left it. I opened up the window. It was still unlocked. I climbed in through the window, shut it, locked it back the way I was supposed to. I turned around and I heard, hello. And it was my dad. And my dad greeted me in a fashion I didn't want to be greeted. But I knew what the will of my dad happened to be, what the will of the father was. I had complete, concise information about what thou shall not do. And God, you know, God, my, my dad told me, and God has told us, that if you do these things, punishment will await you. And so in all of this, whenever someone makes the rules, that person, especially God, that person has, has simply told you that this rule cannot be broken. If it is, you're going to pay for that rule. It's what the Word of God tells us. Let's look at three examples of God's seriousness about sin be it a city, an individual, or even a nation. Let's just take a look at these things. First, let's revisit a place called Sodom and Gomorrah. 
Now, a lot of people, just on a side note, uh, there are those, you know, I've told you about this, that don't believe this was about, you know, sexual sin or perversion or something of that nature. But if you read Jude 7, it talks about the sexual sin and about the perversion that's there and what happened. But God doesn't play games with us. We're not to play games with God. In this idea, suddenly Sodom and Gomorrah, God basically said, that's enough. God, with his patience and compassion, had allowed these cities to exist. And I want to, to just reiterate that over and over again. With God's patience, he allowed these cities to exist. But here we're talking about multiple cities. More than just Sodom and Gomorrah, read you know, Genesis 19 and, you know, and fo following, find out exactly what I'm saying. Several cities, multiple cities, mul uh, multiple towns and multiple people. So this is just not a one-time thing. And, you know, where people believe Sodom and Gomorrah happened to be, that's kind of a, you know, some people believe there. Some people believe, of course, under the uh, Dead Sea, all kinds of things. Genesis 18, 20 through 21, then the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me, and if not, I will know. I've had people use this verse of scripture and say, Mr. Smith, people who aren't believers in the word of God, Mr. Smith, that this is true and your God is omniscient, all-knowing, why would he have to go down? Why couldn't he see? Well, this is just an example of representatives for God being where God would have them to be and, you know, just a directive to be an all fairness and a just God. That's what we're talking about here. And what really amazes me in all of this, after all of this is going on and after the people cry out, you know, let these men, these angels come out that's what the, the men of the city are saying, that we may know them. It is a, you know, a, a very intimate word, that we may know them. I still find it fascinating that the angels had to take Lot and family, well, Lot by his hand, family by the hand, and lead them away from that. Even right in the middle of all of it. Lot knew it was wrong. He didn't condone what was going on. There's misconceptions there too. He knew what was happening. And right in the middle of all of that, right in the middle of the sin, he had to be led out by the hand. Another reason why God probably sent these people in there. And so here Lot is, right in the middle of all of this, whenever we know what God has told us to do, and God says that's enough. Some people are so deeply involved that you have to grab them by the hand do something to pull them out of that. It's called intervention. Maybe you've seen some of that show. I can't watch it. On, uh, I just can't watch that show. I've tried to watch it a couple of times, and it's just not something I want to see. You know, it breaks my heart to see people so down in the world that their total existence is about buying something that's going to destroy them being so addicted to something that they just have to have it. When God says, that's enough. And we ought to have the intelligence to look and to say, that's enough. We see what harm we're, we're doing to our body. But to be so addicted, you have to have that next drink. To be so addicted, you have to, to bet that next bet. To be so addicted, you have to snort something in your nose, stick something in your arm. It doesn't make any sense to us at all. And the Bible tells us that we are to be, if you will, i am told you many times, addicted to, to God and addicted to His Word. But the sad thing is, there are people who will be members of the Lord's body on the right track, members of the Lord's body on the right track, the right faith, believing the right stuff around godly people, godly examples. And somehow, some way, they walk back into the world. And then you have two different types of people that walk back into the world. Those who have to be led by the hand out of that world. And praise God for those people. 
Then you run across those individuals who the Word of God says there is no remedy. They're going to be so far gone, not that the cross is powerless, but so far gone, they're not coming back. I know of people right now that are worshiping in, uh, in denominations that would that have walked away from here, that have said basically to me in so many words, don't ask me who they are, I won't tell you. But have basically said to me in so many words, they'd love to be back here, but they're too embarrassed to because of the way they left. That's a haughty spirit. It's somebody that, that's afraid to say, I was wrong. I've been around this congregation now for 29 years. I know you people. If, if someone that's gone from the, the truth back into the world comes back here, we're going to celebrate that fact. We're not going to rake them over the coals. Amen? That's the idea. The Bible says there's no remedy for those people. I believe what God says. Not that the, the cross is powerless, but some people can be so, become so stubborn, they're just never coming back. Point number one. Point number two. Anybody recognize this guy? Jack looks just like you. Well, this is somebody known Herod Agrippa. If you remember him, and, you know, God wasn't pleased with either his actions or his attitude, and eventually God says, that's enough. How do I know that? Well, you read in Scripture, Acts 12, 21 through 23, on an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration or a speech to the people. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. Now listen. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. That's what we have in scripture. Now the reality of this is that it goes a little farther according to history. This is somebody named Josephus. Uh, he died, as it says, about 110 A.D., and he's the one that wrote so many different things, you know, the, well, I won't get into all that, but I've got books that Josephus have written, a compendium of those in the office, if you'd like to see it. This, of course, is about an individual, about Herod Agrippa. Herod Agrippa. Now, notice this. The Jewish historian Josephus tells of this event in history, and what he says is this. Herod stood in front of the people dressed in silver-lined garments. As he stood there, the morning sun reflected on his clothes. It was shimmering, bright, sparkly. Everybody understand? The people cheered and called him God, or a God. Herod accepted their praise, and God basically said, that's enough. Now you go back and read the history of the Herods. And you're going to find them to be a family that was so jealous, they'd put family members, brothers, sons, put them to death because they were afraid they are going to overthrow them and take over their throne, and they weren't going to have that. Remember reading the story about Herodias and all this? We won't get into all that tonight, but anyway. Suddenly, Herod, according to Josephus, was stricken with terrible pain in his abdomen. Now, Acts 12 says, stricken of worms, and he died. Well, Josephus says, he was in terrible pain in his abdomen, and he uh, doubled over and had to be carried and placed in his bed. And for five days, Herod suffered and then died. I don't know about you. <laughs> I don't know if the remedy even worked. But, you know, I've talked to a lot of you that uh, we'd have to take, you know, castor oil or even kerosene once a year, touch our tongue to kerosene and all of this. And my mom would say, that's, that's so that you won't be wormy. Uh, what makes you think I'm going to be wormy? Well, you're not if you have this. So uh, you know, one day, one day I was just out in the yard and just lying there and mom came out and said, you're sick. I said, no, I just ran out of gas. But I'm uh, just teasing. You'll catch on to that later. But uh, for five days, Herod suffered, and then, and then he died. I don't know about you. That's not a way. God said, that is enough. Okay. Now we have something else I want to talk about, and we're going to close this evening. 
A third example is that God not only loses patience with cities and individuals, He also loses patience with entire nations. I wish America would wake up to that idea. Amen. Get back on the, on the track that we should be on. You know, I, I realize whenever someone is cornered on this and questioned, myself included, what generation would you pick? Were the 1800s more spiritual than the 1900s? You know, 2000, is it a, a, a greater time? When, when is the, uh, back to the first century, what time would you pick? Well, I'm talking about at least back to a, a nation where the majority of the people believe in God. And where the majority of the people believe in morality. We don't parade through the streets. What the Bible clearly calls an abomination. And somehow, some way, we have liberal-minded people. When I say liberal-minded, I'm talking about concerning the Word of God, if they even believe in the Word of God. Making laws about that they don't even believe. Isn't it ironic? And so here we go, and we have, have these people, and the Word of God simply said this. Now, <laughs> watch. Second Chronicles, chapter 36. Verses 11 through 13. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. He did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet, who spoke from the mouth of the Lord. In other words, God put his words in the mouth of Jeremiah. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God. Watch, we're coming back to this. He stiffened his neck. In other words, he was hard-headed. Stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord, the God of Israel. Let's continue this reading before we get to something else. All the officers of the priests and the people like, likewise were exceedingly unfaithful. He ruled for 21 years. Watch. Following all the abominations of the nations, and they polluted the house of the Lord that he had made holy in Jerusalem. They had a holy disdain for the word of God, even though these are supposed to be God's children. So here we go. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers. You know what that's saying? God over and over and over again said, look, I love you. This is the way I want you to go. Over and over and over again. You find it, church. You read it throughout the Word of God. Because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. God says, this is the house of God. My temple, holy place. This is where, or even in the, the, the holy city of God, if you will, even in Jerusalem. This is my place. You are, of all people in the world, you ought to know better. And then it goes on to say, But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people, until there was no remedy. God said, That is enough. And what happened? He said, You people are going to get to a point. You're going to be so far gone. You're never going to come back. I wonder if that ever happened. I wonder if it could happen again. You see, that is the, there's the bottom line we have to be wondering and worried about. Now, <clears throat> put that up there for a specific reason. For over 300 years, the nation of Judah had been living under one godless ruler after another. You let that sink in. One godless ruler after another, and the nation went, went under. They rebelled against God and mocked the messengers he sent, you don't want to hear the preachers, don't want to hear the prophets, don't want to hear about the Word of God. God acted because He had compassion on His people. Sometimes, in the Word of God, whenever you see, like I mentioned this morning, John chapter 15, 
when it talks about Jesus being the true vine and, and we being the branches. And of course, a vine was a symbol of Israel. You find that on bas reliefs and different you know, works of art. But uh, uh, Jesus was saying basically he was the, well, he was the true Israel. He was the vine. And those that would abide in him would have life. And those that didn't, the husbandman, God would prune, cut off, and put in the fire. Sometimes, when you read scripture, you, you come away with the idea, and it's biblical and it's scriptural. Sometimes, and, and I'm, just, I'm just making a statement here, and I believe it's totally true. You can challenge me if you want to, but you're going to be wrong. The truth of the matter is, sometimes, in the Lord's body, there are, are factions and frictions that happen not all of those are bad. Matter of fact, none of us want to see anybody walk away. But the word I read says that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Have you read that too? The word that I read, 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6 says, we're commanded to withdraw from all those who walk how? Disorderly, that military metaphor, meaning marching out of rank. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Don't even have a meal with this person. The Bible tells us also in Romans chapter 16 and verse 17 to watch out for those who are going to try to cause divisions in the Lord's body. Matter of fact, if you have an eldership, and we do, if you have an eldership that loves the Word of God, that's going to stand for the Word of God. Then periodically, there are going to be factions and frictions, listen to me, when those individuals try to do something against the will and purpose of Almighty God. It's going to be there. And when you have an eldership strong enough to stand up, and we do, and to say, that's not happening. Then if those individuals want, not that we have that now, so anybody get the wrong idea. But if those individuals want to remain and cause problems, and the eldership says no when they leave, that's not altogether a bad thing. Because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. The Bible tells us sometimes there are wolves in sheep's clothing. I wonder what that means. Does everybody understand what I'm saying here? It's the same concept when we look at this and he's talking about a nation. It's also true in a congregation. What would make America the greatest nation in the world? Is it the Canadian pipeline? Is it all of our oil reserves? Social Security being around whenever all of us retire? What would make it the greatest nation? I suggest to us it would become a great nation when all of us can get together and agree on what the Word of God says and there's no division among us. Amen? What makes the congregation great? What makes the church great? Well, it's the same, same principle. When they refused, there remained no more a remedy. One last verse of Scripture, and I've completed this. <laughs> Somebody looked at me when I came in today and said, it's all right if you preach a short lesson. It's his fault. No, it's not. Jeremiah 8, 20 through 22. The Word of God says, and I like this part of Scripture, I uh, mention it a lot. The harvest is past, the summer has ended, and we are not saved. Sad thing is, that's going to be true for a lot of people. For the wound of the daughter of my people is my heart wounded. In other words, I have compassion too, Jeremiah is saying. I mourn and dismay has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Now, Gilead was a place from where there was a, a salve, if you will, a, a balm that was for medicinal purposes. They were known for that. So he's asking the question, is there no balm in Gilead? Absolutely there is. Is there no physician there? Absolutely. And he's asking in a spiritual way here. Don't we have the great physician? Can't God heal all of our wounds? Why then has the, the health of the daughter of my people not been restored? 
If the remedy is there, now we're getting back to that point. If the remedy is there for my people, be it a town, a city, a nation, or an individual, why are people walking with blind eyes? Spiritually. Why haven't they taken advantage? Why, in their life, do they have to hear God saying, and he, you know, and I believe it's what the Word of God is about, especially in the, in the Christian dispensation, that's enough. It's enough. One of these days, we all know this, as well as anything else. And I'm going to leave this here for my son to come and get. But uh, we all know this. One of these days, as surely as we're breathing right now, Lord's coming again. I don't dread that. I don't know about you, but I think about that quite often, especially the older I get. I think about it quite often. Jesus coming again. You know, that's not a bad deal. That's something to, that's something to, to smile about. Jesus is coming again. We're going to be at a place that words can't describe for all eternity. I don't know about you, but that just sounds so exciting to me. Now, I'm not trying to liken the idea of, of heaven being equivalent to a vacation. I'm just using an illustration here. How many of us in here have saved up plan to go on a vacation of our dreams or whatever and you had such a great time that you really didn't want to leave. Now I've had some that I've gone to that didn't live up to the billing. But you ever had a great time someplace you wish it wouldn't end? You look so excited. Can you imagine going to a place that you've looked forward to going to that didn't cost you a single penny. And you're going to be around the greatest people this world's ever known. You listening to me? And around Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you get to be there for all eternity. And again, it didn't cost you one single penny. How does that sound? It's for those individuals who have been obedient to the Word of God. Those who have been baptized into Christ, lived obediently for the rest of their life. Not that they won't make mistakes, they will. But they have enough common sense and love for God that they're not going to walk away. They're going to say, I failed you, Father. I need you to forgive me. Maybe someone here tonight needs to respond once you come as we stand and sing.